Let me welcome everybody to this second of the Faculty of Classics webinar series. And I should immediately um, say that we're very sorry this evening that we had hoped that we would have Rose Farabee and Martin Millet in conversation. And unfortunately, Rose is unable to be with us because she's had to go to a family funeral. So what you will have, instead of having me introducing Rose and Martin, is you will have me in conversation with Martin, um, though we are able to give Rose an appearance uh, later in the programme, um, courtesy of uh, a video uh, that we are able to share with you. But it is a great pleasure um, to be able to introduce Martin Millet. Martin has been the Lawrence Professor of Classical Archaeology since uh, 2001. He burst onto the classical scene with a book on the Romanization of Britain in 1990, which totally changed the way in which people thought about Roman Britain and its Romanization and uh, changed the agenda of Romano-British studies. And Martin has continued to be very heavily associated with Roman Britain, um, a general book for English heritage in the 1990s, a much more recent co-edited Oxford um, handbook um, of Roman Britain. Uh, but Martin has also worked very widely across the Roman Empire, uh, in Spain, uh, in Italy, particularly with projects at um, Ostia and Portus, uh, and in the Tiber Valley. Um, but always with a foot back in Roman Britain. Uh, and it's Martin's work at Oldborough uh, that we're going to explore this evening. Um, Martin, it's very good uh, of you to agree to uh, speak this evening about uh, your work at Oldborough, um, and very good of you to agree to do it in conversation with me rather than in conversation with Rose. Um, uh, we should start, I think, particularly since last time's webinar was on Pompeii, uh, by saying something about Oldborough itself, since rather unlike Pompeii or even unlike, you know, Verulamium, uh, Oldborough is not quite a name to conjure with, even less perhaps as Isurium uh, than it is under, under its, its modern name. So, where is Oldborough? Why on earth is it of importance? Why do you expect anybody to be interested in uh, coming to a webinar about it? Um, thanks, Robin. Let's um, share my screen if I can. Um, uh, that's not looking so good. Uh, uh, Something's happening. Uh, are you seeing? Uh, we're seeing a black screen at the moment. Yeah, that's that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's just. Uh, sorry about this. We tried it earlier, and it worked quite nicely. Uh, oh. There we are. Is that looking better, Robin? Nothing has happened yet. There we are. Yeah, no, that's looking, you're on the last slide. Yep. There we are. Um. <laughs> all right, everyone gets a quick right, break. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll shut your eyes then. And sorry, sorry for uh, uh, doing that. I'm not quite sure what went wrong. Um, the first part of your question, Robin, is where is Aldborough, um, which is uh, one of those questions we quite often get asked by people who've just been to Suffolk and couldn't found the Roman town. <laughs> um, uh, our Aldborough, the Old Borough, um, is uh, just by Borough Bridge off the A1 in North Yorkshire. And uh, it's, um, it's a beautiful place, good, nice place to work, as you'll see uh, in a moment. Um, it's uh, important within Roman Britain 
as it was the capital of the Kivitas of the Brigantes. And uh, those of you who uh, sort of know your classical sources for Roman Britain, I'm sure all of you will be aware that the Brigantes were um, a thorn in the side of the Romans uh, at the time of conquest. Um, their original uh, sort of base was up at Stanic here uh, in the Tees Valley. Um, but after conquest, uh, for reasons that we don't fully understand, um, their uh, chief city was established at Aldborough. So Aldborough is the, if you like, the civil administrative centre for a large chunk of Northern England, um, depending how one uh, sort of reads the evidence, certainly the area of what's now North Yorkshire up into the Tees. Um, probably the area across the Pennines and probably the area as far um, up as Hadrian's Wall. So a really big chunk of uh, Roman Britain. And um, it's important in terms of my understanding, my interest in Roman Britain, because it lies at the interface between the thing that I'm most interested in, which are the um, indigenous population, the civil population of Roman Britain, and the uh, areas of military power um, on Hadrian's Wall, in the hinterland of Hadrian's Wall, and of course at York. So it's a fantastic site for looking at Roman urban development in Britain and the relationship between Roman power and indigenous people. And the other thing about it is um, it's a beautiful location today. And um, thanks to being a rotten borough uh, from the uh, reign of Queen Elizabeth I down to the Great Reform Act of 1832, um, it's largely unoccupied. There's a village on it, but through the 18th century, the Duke of Newcastle prevented it developing into a town because that would have made returning his two M members of parliament more expensive. <laughs> uh, it's strange the things that cause the archaeological record to be either propitious or unpropitious, but in this case propitious. Uh, so when you started working there, did people already know anything about Oldborough or is your work, you know, started the story as it were? It, our work certainly doesn't start the story, and um, uh, I've been debating whether whether I should try and score points off Andrew and Mary from uh, the last webinar. webinar. Um, but I would make the point that um, Aldborough has been explored archaeologically for longer than Pompeii and Herculaneum. <laughs> uh, uh, the first systematic work was done there um, by uh, the, the Reverend Morris, the vicar, from uh, 1680 uh, to about 1710. And uh, through that period of um, the early antiquarian work, um, Aldborough was one of the places in Roman Britain that people wrote about, visited and talked about. Um, there are a couple of mosaics that were excavated in the uh, uh, very early uh, 18th century and there are lovely stories of people paying to visit them at that period. Um, through the uh, 18th century there was some um, really very good archaeological recording done. Um, Eli Hargrove, the image on the right here, um, recorded uh, what turns out to be part of the forum um, in 1770 in an unpublished manuscript which also appears in one of the copies of Camden's Britannia in a slightly different form. And um, this must be one of the earliest systematic excavations on a Roman site in Britain. But then um, after the Great Reform Act of 1832, um, a local man, Andrew Lawson, bought the whole of Aldborough from the Duke of Newcastle, who no longer had much interest in it. And for the next um, uh, 35 years or so, um, Lawson uh, sponsored a whole series of excavations 
uh, that reveal different parts of the town, including this uh, lovely mosaic that is now on display in the um, English heritage site. Um, those things were relatively well recorded for the uh, first half of the 19th century and the, a book on the site was published in 1852. Um, so until the middle of the 19th century, Aldborough was one of the really well explored sites. But then um, things sort of go downhill, at least until we arrive um, in 2009, um, with a uh, a couple of campaigns of excavations in the 20th century, um, local vicar doing some work in the 1920s um, in uh, a not terribly systematic way. But then very interesting campaign of work um, between 1934 and 1939, which had not the uh, war intervened, I think would have developed into something very much more interesting. Um, led by Mary Kitson Clark, who was a big antiquary in Yorkshire in the 1930s, but in partnership with a young guy called JNL Myers, who went on uh, to distinguished career as the Bodley librarian, mm -hmm. and Kenneth Steer, who ended up running archaeology in Scotland. And they did um, a whole series of really very good excavations on the defences. It was um, truncated by, by war, and after the war, very, very little was done. Some very poorly ex recorded excavations in the 1950s and 60s, bit of field work uh, by the Yorkshire Archaeological Society in the uh, 80s, um, but then only tiny little bits of work as people were extending their houses and having garages built and so forth until um, the uh, 2000s when we arrived on site. Right, so, so what we're looking at on screen at the moment is a bit of the defences. Um, it's a bit um, underneath the defences um, in the northern part of the town, uh, which is um, uh, it, labelled on the um, slide from Mary Kitts and Clark's archive as sleeper beams. Um, these are Flavian timber buildings uh, that relate to the very early phases of the town. Um, it's one of the only bits of structure of that period that has ever been excavated. Right, right. And the previous slide, the mosaic, that comes from a private house? Or? That comes from a private house. It comes from um, this part of the private house, of which is a big courtyard running over to the right, um, with a private bath suite uh, attached. Um, and there were two mosaics uh, excavated in um, 1848 and 1832 here. Um, they're part of um, a series of larger houses uh, that occupy parts of the site that were dug into in the 1830s, uh, 40s, 50s. And, and their date is, is what? Well, the mosaics here, one of them is a late to Roman one, this one, and the other one is uh, probably second century, but the bulk of the material from the big houses are fourth century, so they're large, um, you know, elite Roman townhouses, and Aldborough has one of the biggest collections of mosaics in northern Britain, it's something like 30 uh, known mosaics, so um, much more opulent in that sense than anything we know from York at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So before you got there, we, we knew that we'd got a defended town. We, we knew that we got some rich housing um, and, and people had recognised that bit of forum as, as a bit of forum? Yeah, um, it was first recognised as the forum by Myers publishing his excavation. Okay, so what have you done? <laughs> I mean, it sounds as if well, we already knew quite a lot. <laughs> well, um, as with so many um, of the sites, uh, we know lots and lots from these excavations about very small bits of the town. But we have, um, the, and the town, just to give you a feel for it, the church here lies over the forum. And the forum is more or less at the centre of the town. The west gate is under the manor here. The east gate is over by the hall here. And in the foreground, you can just see a slight rise. That's the town wall running round there. 
it runs up through through the woodland here where the English Heritage Site is and comes back round here you can see uh, very clearly the defences uh, yep. uh, cut in there and comes down this side and there's an amphitheatre up here. And what we set out to do was to do um, two things initially. Firstly was to draw together all the information from previous work uh, so that we could begin to see uh, what picture it was giving us of the town. And uh, alongside that, um, we undertook um, quite large scale geophysical survey. A geophysical survey for the most part was um, magnetometry or technically gradiometry. Here's a picture of Rose um, early uh, on in the project, which started in 2009. Um, walking across the fields and these uh, sort of the sides of the H um, are each magnetic coils with a computer in the middle. As you walk across the ground um, the difference in magnetic signal between the bottom of the pile and the top there um, gives you an indication of the strength of the magnetic field underneath. Um, when you put all this together like dots on a television screen, pixels, um, you can pick out the areas of high magnetic readings, black, low magnetic readings, in uh, lighter colours here, and you can begin to see uh, the elements of the town. So this is the this part of the town, the northern part of the town, and we can see the buildings, uh, you can see uh, streets running through, you can see bits of the town wall and so forth, big buildings here. Um, smaller buildings here. Um, these very big signals are highly magnetic, um, indicate very big building. So what we did was to do that across the whole of the town as far as we could and uh, from that Rose uh, did an analytical drawing showing all these features put together. Um, you can see the town wall again coming round here. Um, this area just spotlighted but we were also looking at the areas outside the town walls up to the river and the bridge, uh, the road up to Hadrian's Wall, the road out to York here uh, with uh, burial features on it as opposed to the settlement features on the road up here and agricultural and other industrial features around the outside. So what we were trying to do was to use um, remote sensing techniques to map the town and that's Magnetometry is complemented by uh, some work using uh, radar that I don't want to say very much about um, this evening, it's another story, um, but that we used in areas where the uh, magnetometry didn't produce particularly good results. And then in a second stage of work that began in 2016, we um, have done a series of comparatively small excavations. What these excavations have done is to focus on places that have already been dug, uh, where we could um, use the damage, if you like, that had already been done to the site to give us windows into the archeology. span And also at the same time, test the accuracy of the previous records and get dating evidence for it. So it's getting more out of what's already there. And the largest of these excavations is the one that's interrupted by COVID last year, 2019, where we've got uh, one of the streets in the Roman town here, the other street leading up to the North Gate here, um, a series of uh, later Roman buildings and a trench that's going down into earlier Roman deposits uh, underneath, trying to give us a a chronology for the site as well as a feeling for um, what's going on and samples of pottery and so forth for understanding trade and so forth and interestingly in this particular excavation finding quite a lot of industrial material. And the fourth strand of what we've been doing is um, using a uh, coring, a uh, sort of standard geological technique, if you like, to um, take samples across the areas, particularly over towards the river, 
to try and understand the history of the natural environment of the town, how the rivers changed and how the relationship with the, between the river and the town has changed. We were very fortunate in doing that to hit upon um, an old stream bed that has produced a 4.6 meter deep uh, pollen core, which we've just had analyzed, which gives us the vegetational history of the Aldborough area from uh, about 5,000 BC down to 1000 AD. And as well as giving us the vegetational history through the pollen, um, we've just embarked on a study of that core to look at pollution uh, in the Iron Age and Roman period, because this area seems to have been a very important one for uh, exploiting lead from the Pennines. So we should be able to map the intensity of lead pollution through the sequence from that. So what we're doing is bringing a whole variety of um, techniques and methods to bear on the site to try and rewrite its history but also to understand its changing topographic development and spatial development. So can you do an agricultural history from 5000 BC to 1000 AD on the basis of these pollen cores? You can see um, the uh, plants which deposit pollen. Now there's a complex issue of which plants deposit pollen and how far that pollen gets. Yeah. There's a lot of work being done on that, but it, you can very easily see the balance between um, tree pollen and cereal pollens. And we see there that in the Iron Age, this area becomes dominated by um, arable agriculture, sort of wheat, barley type thing. And that that uh, situation continues through the Roman period without very much change and through into the uh, medieval, uh, early medieval period. So um, as with all these techniques, there are limits to what you can do and sort of it's easy to overstate what you can do with them. But combining that with the other botanical information we've got from sampling the excavated deposits, we're getting a very good idea of the arable economy. And, and, and if you just talk us through what we can see on this map, are we seeing field boundaries well, or what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing um, the interpretation of the magnetometry um, which uh, this is the Roman road, the bridge, the river Ure is here. Yeah. The bridge is um, somewhere here. We have to say failed to locate it properly uh, last September uh, because the depth of deposits rather greater than we thought. And this is the road coming down towards the north gate of the town. This is the northern limit of the town. Yeah. Um, on top of that, these curved features um, there and there are uh, medieval agriculture, they're rich in furrow. Right. And underneath those, uh, we have a series of settlement enclosures facing onto the Roman road. They are visible on either side, uh, more clearly visible up here. Yeah. Trackway connecting to the fields, um, probably the uh, flood bank for the river. And um, these things going further out are uh, field boundaries of the Roman period. Um, and uh, if we were zooming in closer along the edges of the road, we've got vestiges of buildings showing up. You can't see them on this, at this scale. So you were trying to get a, an overall picture of Oldborough and, and, and what it was like and, and, and how it worked. Um, do we have now a, a better sense of its place within the history of Roman Britain? Yes, I think so. Um, I, th I think the what one needs to say always with archaeological evidence is that uh, what you're trying to do is to draw the strands together to write a story, but you know that it's only ever going to be a sort of provisional story, and uh, that story should generate further work to test the limits of your understanding and extend it. 
But what we've been able to do um, with uh, Albra is to pull out the sequence of development of the town. We can do this with the areas around about to some extent as well. Um, and it seems to start off um, not as a Roman fort as what as people had previously thought, but as a settlement founded probably between AD 70 and 80. There's a little bit of debate about how early um, Roman conquest of this area under Petilius Cerealis starts in AD 70, 71. There's a fort just um, a couple of kilometers away uh, that dates to that period. And there is clearly evidence of that period uh, coming up underneath later Roman Aldborough. Uh, I think that the key to understanding that is that it must be tied in with uh, the support and supply of the military. And it's based on the road um, that links Rowcliffe, the fort, to York, which is the military base at the time. And significantly, it's also at the closest point that that road goes to a navigable river at the head of navigation on the river. So it's the furthest you can bring boats up the river. And um, what we seem to get there is the development of um, a settlement, if you like, dealing with the materiel for the army. Um, and around about AD 80, 81, nearby in the Pennines, um, we have evidence, this lead pig from Hachel Moor, of um, lead production. Um, now it's not lead that the Roman army are interested in, it's the silver. And so the lead is the byproduct. And this is the nearest point where you can get that lead and silver onto a river, which is a much easier way of moving it. And incidentally, it's also the area that was used for um, transport of lead in the 18th century. And it was also the center of lead smelting in the 12th century. So um, what I think we've got here is a combination of supplying the army and the link to extractive industry that brings uh, traders and settlers to settle here in the period within a decade of Roman annexation of the region. And that develops as quite a large settlement quite quickly um, down in the period down to around about AD 100, um, at which time it's mentioned in the Binderland tablets as a place that is on the supply route up to the Roman frontier. And it's probably that drawing people together, the economic activity and so forth, that um, leads Rome to choose it as the place to govern the Kivitas from. There's no evidence for a pre-Roman indigenous settlement here of any size. So um, it's not a, um, if you like, a verulamium of um, just an indigenous settlement that's translated into a Roman town. This is something a little bit more complicated. But by around about AD 120, there is a planned town being laid out, sorry. Um, uh, the planned town being laid out with the forum that we saw in that 1770 plan that we resampled in 2017 to give us a date for it. Um, the layout of the grid of the Roman streets that we get from the geophysics and the alignment of the road up to the bridge, which must have been built um, at the same time as the town, because until then the uh, crossing was higher up river at Rowcliffe. And um, that seems to coincide with the terracing of the southern part of the town here to create, um, if you like, a a stepped town plan so that those people who live in the elite houses later on look across um, uh, the landscape of the town um, in a, a quite a sophisticated architectural 
platform. And it's probably around about the same time that the amphitheatre that we found in the survey um, was also laid out. So do we, do we think it was made the capital of the Brigantes, as it were, from the time it, you can first see it? Or is that something that's happening to it as part of this story? Well, we don't know, is the honest answer. Uh, the conventional narrative is that the Kivitas structure of northern Britain is comparatively late in the Hadrianic period. Um, I think you could argue that that might be the case. You can also make a coherent argument that uh, the, in this part of the country, they will have wanted to get some form of civil administration in place uh, relatively early in the 80s or thereabouts. Um, which is what R.G. Collingwood actually said in uh, 1927. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's also, um, I think you need to separate um, in a way that archaeologists have tended to conflate um, the building of the town and the layout of the town and the forum with the administrative structure. Lots of evidence in other parts of the empire that the administrative structure can exist um, for decades before uh, the town is monumentalised. Uh, my inclination is to think that they're probably getting some form of um, civil structure in place in the Flavian period. Okay. Um, the, the, the town then develops and we can talk about these images if you want to, but the other thing that I, I think is really very interesting in terms of what we've got from the sequence is that um, the uh, town remains important into the early medieval period. Um, it's a very significant place at Doomsday and the church, although it is now um, 14th century construction, um, is uh, almost certainly a pre-Norman Conquest foundation. It is beautifully located in the middle of the forum um, in a, a topographic form that's familiar to us from other parts of the Roman Empire, but not very common in Britain. Um, and there is accumulating evidence that um, the uh, site is in occupation um, well into the fifth century. Um, our 2019 excavation had a series of um, middens and dumps with lots of animal bone in, uh, which seem to date to the uh, late 4th, early 5th century. There's a hearth cut through the forum that is radiocarbon dated to the uh, sort of end of the 4th century. And um, interestingly, the geophysics shows um, that uh, sometime after the latest phase of defences, uh, which complicated argument would seem to be um, at the very earliest in the late 4th or early 5th century, um, another gateway is cut through the town wall and a road extending the street grid out into this, uh, this area uh, defined by an annex uh, was laid out. So um, there are tantalising glimpses, if you like, of uh, the um, late Roman to early Ro post-Roman transition and this remaining as potentially quite an important um, site after sort of Roman military and uh, civil government uh, disappears in the fifth century. Interesting. So do you think that the church actually, as it were, replaces a Roman basilica? Is, is that the story you're wanting to, to tell? Well, I think there are, there are um, two lines that I think are plausible. One is that um, there's a continuing community here uh, through the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries um, and that the both the communication routes and the topography make um, the Forum Square yep. a sensible place to build. Um, and there may well have been some recollection of uh, continued um, importance uh, that relates to its function as a forum. Um, the other 
thing is that it's a, a large flat area um, surrounded by um, a very useful uh, pre-cut stone, yes. <laughs> which um, when the first church is built is uh, given there's little evidence for primary quarrying at that time, um, is uh, the natural place to, to uh, build your big stone church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you, one, one of the things we can obviously see here, or I take it we can see here, is, uh, I mean, you talked about the late Roman defences, but we can see the arrival of a town wall on your AD 200 yep. plan. Um, so is that when you think the town wall is first created and why create it then? Well, I think it's created about 20 years before that. Yeah. Um, there is a very long-running debate about the date of that particular town wall um, and I I'm tend to follow um, Myers and Steer and Kitts and Clark in seeing it as around about 180. I think they were really good archaeologists and the people who've tried to push it later um, haven't read the evidence as well as they have. Um, <coughs> if it's around 180 it's earlier than most other town walls in Roman Britain. Um, and you really pay your money and take your choice on what the explanation is. Um, the conventional explanation is that town walls were needed because of defensive needs and the common thing is that it's to do with the removal by Clodius Albinus of the legions to fight uh, uh, Severus. Um, that doesn't work here, and I doubt that it works anywhere else. Um, if you're into those sorts of historical contexts, there is um, all kinds of uh, bits of evidence for um, trouble with the Brigantes at various stages, and that could give you the excuse to build a town wall. Um, my own take on this is that the town wall is um, very carefully placed um, and it's very carefully placed to be um, invisible, both as you arrive from York until you come uh, very close to the town wall, and uh, when you come in from, from the south, where it's behind the top of the ridge. Um, neither of those things make good sense in defensive terms. And I suspect that town walls are largely to do with saying, look, we're an urban centre and the wall defines our um, aspirations to be uh, what we think a Roman town should look like. Now I could go on asking you question after question but we want to leave some time for those who come along to the webinar to ask their own questions uh, which I hope they'll do by you know writing them into the Q&A and um, while we're speaking uh, but I also want to ask you a bit about where Rose's work comes in. We've seen Rose already I yep. think twice, is that right? We've seen oh, her right. in her scientific hat and doing the uh, the magnetometry and, and, and then uh, standing by the auger, I think I yep. saw Rose again. But, but she has another side to her work, is that right? Yeah, Rose um, is a fantastically good archaeologist and uh, has done uh, the lead work on a lot of the survey on the site and we've jointly run the uh, excavations and continue to do so. But as well as being um, uh, a great archaeologist, she is also a, a very innovative artist. Um, this is one of her uh, paintings uh, inspired by the site. There are a series of other paintings she's done of, of other sites. Um, but she's been um, very much in the forefront of thinking about the relationship between contemporary art and uh, archaeology. Um, both in the visual senses here, and as we're going to see in a moment, um, through thinking about how the subterranean uh, elements of um, the world uh, that we explore as archaeologists might be expressed in other ways through sound in particular. And she's um, led a series of initiatives, um, both uh, practical things, she's she, she done uh, some stonework on the site with uh, showing people how stone is carved and how that relates to the development of the town walls and 
so forth. But she's also led this um, fantastic Arts Council funded project um, called Sound Marks that uh, presents the topography and the archaeology of the site in entirely new ways by combining uh, visual arts with um, sort of a soundtrack that she's developed um, with Rob St. John. And I think you're going to um, yeah, share I'm, some of that with us. Let, let, let's share that in a moment. Um, before, we, before we do that, I mean, it sounds like that was a very clever way of getting the Arts Council to fund some of your archaeology. Um, <laughs> but you, you've had a whole mosaic of funders, is that right, that have made yeah. this possible? Um, uh, I, I got to disabuse you of the idea that we're getting the Arts Council to fund us as archaeologists, because that would uh, be um, entirely wrong. No, that was a, um, independent funding for, for Rose and Rob. Um, the, but on the archaeological side, um, we've been fortunate to have a series of sponsors. Um, we, the early work um, and uh, most of the geophysics uh, was funded uh, through mosaic funding. So we trained students that used FS Salisbury funds from the classics faculty for that. Uh, we've had research funding from the Macdonald Institute and um, the, uh, for instance, the lead pollution work we're doing, we've just had money from the British Academy for. Um, and we've had a series of grants, the Royal Archaeological Institute, the Site of Antiquaries and so forth. So that's the sort of standard route. Mm. Um, but the um, works from 2000. 16 to 2019, very generously funded by a philanthropic donor, um, the late Chris Martins, who, um, someone who uh, had an early career after taking a degree in geography in um, advertising uh, and uh, was uh, big in promoting and designing one of the coffee chains in the 1990s. Um, got interested in archaeology and uh, started doing a PhD with me when I was in Durham and he then got in touch when we were working at Aldbury, he lived nearby and um, he and his wife Jan very generously uh, funded the project for um, three and a half uh, years uh, just uh, up until uh, Chris died uh, uh, because he uh, loved the area, he was keen on archaeology and uh, he, he liked to see something that made a difference and he thought we were making a difference. Very good, very good. Okay, I'm gonna go and now share with everybody uh, a bit of Rose. So we're going to see three minutes of the uh, Sandmark um, uh, video. Um, uh, so listen away. Sandmarks is a collaboration between myself, Rose Ferriby, an archaeologist and artist, and the sonic and visual artist Rob St John. In our previous work, we've both been attentive to the patterns and processes of different landscapes, focusing in on small details to weave broader narratives of people and place. In Soundmarks, we spent six months exploring the Olbra landscape and its history to create new work which stands art and archaeology. Approaching Olbra's subsurface secrets through creative practice opened up spaces to work that set the imagination afloat. It also allowed us to play with process, to experiment, test, push and pull the ways in which we both work, to learn from one another and in doing so extend our idea of the subsurface and find new ways of combining our practice. Our exploration began during the annual excavations at the site, allowing a rare view below the turf into the various surfaces, materials and stratigraphies, as well as the archaeological practices that are used to find them. Rob began recording around the trench, experimenting with ways of documenting the excavations and sound. In doing so, an expanded form of listening was revealed, one that amplified the very material world that we inhabit as archaeologists. 
brought everything into sharp focus, listening your way into the earth. From these early experiments on site, we took our exploration out into the wider landscape. We fished for sound using hydrophones in the river, detecting the hubbub of life below the meandering loops and eddies. Plants photosynthesizing, insects stridulating, sonic traces of activity beyond our usual sensory perceptions. We attached contact mics to plant stems, hearing the woody descent of raindrops and hazy birdsong beyond to a creaky gate on the floodplain that emitted deep, earthbound groans through the twilight. Unexpected materials reverberated aspects of a something other in the landscape. Secretive sounds from hidden places. A super sensitive microphone was lowered into the descending void of a borehole, emitting a claustrophobic gathering of air and chambered enclosure that plunge the imagination into sudden depths. With each experiment, each recording, the landscape seemed to expand in possibilities and in close focused details and memories. It was an excavation in sound, attentive listening mixed with the sending out of signals to hear what might come back. Sound and image began to bounce back and forth my interpretive maps of geophysical surveys were used by Rob to create musical scores, subsurface traces becoming notations of place. I began painting to the collected sounds, scribbling marks from an oral world, back and forth, mixed in walks and talks, photographing, digging, leaving and returning. The subsurface of Olbra began to find cohesive creative form. In our studios, these were whittled and tweaked, growing into the final pieces. In doing so, we expanded our own idea of the subsurface to listen and look through all kinds of materials, bringing these elements together to weave in and out in space and time, just as our own perception of landscape does. Okay, I'm going to stop at that point. Uh, we're going to give everybody the URL at the end so they can uh, hear the whole of that. But I hope that gives a flavour of, or at least a sound um, bite from uh, from Rose's work. Uh, and um, tell us a bit about how, how that project developed, because you then had a, an exhibition in Oldborough, is that right? Yes. Uh, well, it, the work, the artwork, the sound work and the um, sort of graphic work was funded by the Arts Council um, with the end product being a, an exhibition in Aldborough. Um, the exhibition is supposed to be coming to the Museum of Classical Archaeology and touring other places but that's been sort of rather put on hold by uh, Covid and alongside the uh, sort of exhibition um, there is a trail so you can walk round Aldborough and stop at particular places um, and hear the sounds of the site at that place through your headphones um, on the uh, a, a web broadcast. This is perhaps the appropriate point at which we should encourage everybody to put Oldborough on their map for a visit uh, this summer, um, where they will be able to go around the remains guided by your guidebook, is that right? Yes, there's a, there's a small um, English heritage site there. Um, the display boards that Rose has been working on for some time should be in place by, I think, by the time the site opens. Uh, there's a nice little museum um, and if you download the sound mark thing you can follow the route uh, around the village as well. So there's um, within the village there's not in much of the Roman to see uh, unless you know the site particularly well uh, but you do get this extraordinary experience of um, 
new way of seeing the landscape through walking and experiencing sound marks. It's quite a, a brilliant piece of work, I think. Yeah, well, quite unlike anything else you can experience elsewhere, that's for sure. Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the things that I would pull out of this. Is it's a, a, at one level, it's a fairly conventional archaeological project, uh, but it's directions in which it's going with Rose's art uh, and creative work um, are completely original and uh, uh, both uh, surprising and um, sort of always uh, mind expanding, I think. Thank you very much, Martin. Let me at this point uh, change from being interviewer, as it were, <laughs> to, to simply being chairman uh, and invite those who have been listening to us uh, to ask whatever questions uh, they would like to ask of Martin. Um, we have one question uh, already, so let's start with that, um, which is a question about the town walls. So the question is, uh, if the town walls were not primarily defensive, then who would have taken the decision to build them? Ah, well. <laughs> is, is this a local decision? You know, is top down, bottom up? Well, again, there's sort of 50 years of uh, academic debate about uh, who builds town walls. Um, my own view is that uh, this would have been a local decision by the elders of the Kivitas uh, to do it. Uh, they would undoubtedly have needed um, the support of the governor. Um, you can't build town walls unless the governor says you can. Um, but I think it's unlikely, given the lack of contemporaneity of walls across Roman Britain, the old argument that this was a central decision by the governor who told everyone to go and do it um, can be sustained. Yeah. Um, we've just been asked what the Roman name for Oldborough was. Uh, I did use it right at the beginning, but, but tell us about the Roman name, Martin. Isurium Brigantum. Uh, Isurium is probably connected to the river. Um, although uh, we've got colleagues who could probably wax lyrical on Celtic uh, place <laughs> names. Um, uh, um, the Brigantium element, of course, from, comes from the Brigantes, so it is Isurium of the Brigantes. So, um, I mean, that raises a question which I've been wondering whether I would ask throughout the, your talking, which is about the relationship between this place and York. I mean, York's not very far away, very um, but York is very much a top-down place. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, uh, York is uh, primarily a military base. It's the uh, base of the Legion. And uh, certainly by the later Roman period, um, the government is based there. Uh, it becomes the capital province. And of course, um, both Severus and um, Constantius Chlorus um, use it as their base, which is, so it's the Roman power center. Um, it develops as a civil town as well, but the date at which that's happening is probably much later than Aldborough, um, probably later second century or thereabouts. And um, in effect, I think what we're seeing is that Aldborough would have been the place which is the indigenous power center for the administration of the non-military areas. York is very much plugged into central power, but he's also uh, controlling the frontier. So there's some sort of, if you like, symbiotic relationship yeah. between them. Um, but uh, it's not as though one is directly competing, if you like, with the other. 
So we have we have a question about the exploitation of the the silver and the lead. Mm. Does that have an Iron Age background to it, or is that something that is new under Rome? Uh, a very good question. Um, it seems to be new under Rome, uh, but it's actually very difficult to date metalworking. And there's some very, very interesting work that's been done very recently at Scotch Corner with the rebuilding of the A1, which shows that there is quite large scale Iron Age, late Iron Age metallurgical working actually with copper, which is mined very close to Scotch Corner. And, um, but that copper is being alloyed with other things, including gold and silver. And we don't know where the gold and silver is coming from. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, there wasn't silver lead exploitation in the Pennines in the Iron Age, but it's difficult to map it at the moment, which is where this work we've just started on the pollen core comes in. So we can date the pollen core through radiocarbon. And we, we can see the vegetational change. And by doing um, chemical analysis of the core at very fine intervals, we should be able to see at what stage lead pollution is coming in. And if lead pollution is coming in in the Iron Age, uh, bingo, we have the answer to the question. <laughs> okay, so we have to watch this spot. <laughs> watch this spot, yes. <laughs> very good. Um, uh, can I, I mean, on, on, on the back of that, what you said about the pollen core shows that we've got cereal cultivation in, in this area before we've got a town, a, a settlement. So do we think that there is some settlement not very far away and that what is happening, at least in part, is a sort of drift to this particularly good bridgehead site? Yeah. Um... Again, uh, until comparatively recently, the mapping of rural settlement in this area has been very, very difficult. The soils aren't very good for ethnography and so forth. Um, that very hot summer in 2018 produced a series of crop marks that show that there are Iron Age settlements around about. And various different people, including us doing geophysical survey work are now picking up the Iron Age settlement site. So I'm fairly confident that by the time that Rome arrives in this area, it's a widely exploited arable landscape with lots of small farms. What we don't have in that landscape at the moment, and it might turn up the next field we do geophysics in, um, is any evidence for any large scale centre of population or power in the Iron Age. So the shift of uh, power as a centre is something that is coming after the Roman conquest and I think is tied in with this uh, exploitation of resources and the link to uh, the head of navigation on the river. And, and does your detailed work enable you to see how large the Roman town is in terms of population? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> it's small. Um, uh, you, we can see roughly the area occupied. Yeah. We can see the density of occupation. So we're talking about a population at a guesstimate of a few thousand at the maximum, three to five thousand. But I, I, I would say that one of the things that when you look across the Roman Empire, generally, the Roman towns are plentiful, but generally very small. And you know, Rome is clearly the exception. Uh, but for the most part, Roman urbanism is characterized by relatively small communities. And how big would York have been? Well, York, you've got 5,000 soldiers for a kickoff. <laughs> uh, the area of the civil settlement in York seems to be smaller than that at um, Aldborough. Right. Um, so you know, it's going, the civil population is probably going to be, again, in the low thousands. Right. 
So we, we have a question about whether Oldbrus the site which produced the Romulus and Remus mosaic. <laughs> yes, the question is when it was produced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there it, it was found, or it's, it was first published in 1862. And uh, interestingly, it's published by Henry Eckroyd Smith, who wrote the book in 1852. And he says rather mysteriously, um, I'm going to publish this now. I omitted it from my book for very good reasons. <laughs> and um, and it, he, that the evidence is that it was um, produced by a local builder. And uh, by produced, I mean, not simply discovered, but probably manufactured by yeah. a local builder, um, probably out of tessery that had been found in the earlier excavations. And um, he rather sportingly sort of put it together and uh, <laughs> it has been in the literature on Roman Britain ever since. <laughs> yeah, how interesting. Right. One final question, um, uh, which is appropriately looking forward. So what do you want to look at next? Where do you go next? Well, we're desperate to get back to the site we started in 2019, because at the bottom of the sequence of that, um, we found a very large um, ironworking complex that seems to be smithing complex. Um, interestingly using coal as its fuel. Um, we've got a PhD student now working on that. Um, and I'm interested in that early stuff at, in that excavation area to explore this issue of the extent to which um, the material for the Roman army might be being generated there. But I'm also interested in the other bit of the top layer that we want to go back to, because now we've got this um, very late radiocarbon date and bits of um, what appears to be fifth century timber building. I want to see more of that. I've been frustrated by COVID in not being able to go back last year. So I'm champing at the bit to get into the field this summer. <laughs> and what about Rose? Does Rose have further projects to, explore the sound and sights as it were? Um, well, she's going to be sort of a co-conspirator on yeah. the excavation, of course. Um, she got various ideas uh, that she wants to develop with uh, artistic work, but I don't think any of them have yet been sort of nailed down, if you like. So I think watch this space, there's going to be um, creative activity you can be absolutely certain of it. Very good, thank you very much. So thank you very much to Martin and thank you to everybody who's attended and particularly to those who've asked questions. Uh, the um, final slide which Neil will put up in a moment will give you the details of the URL you need to watch that video by um, Rose. Uh, and you know, I do commend it to you, at the, as you saw from the clip, the photography is just stunning and, and the whole notion of uh, listening to the landscape really quite mind-blowing. Um, so uh, even in uh, Roman Britain, uh, there are some really exciting things happening. You don't have to go all the way to Pompeii to find uh, chariots and uh, skeletons. Uh, there are also exciting things happening in the classics faculty that aren't archaeology and I hope you will come back in a fortnight's time uh, when uh, Tim Whitmarsh and Simon Goldhill uh, will be talking about the relationship between classics and Christianity. But for tonight, thank you very much and good night. Thank you.